everybody ready? Hey, thank you for coming to our 2 p.m. panel here at the 56 DAC in the DAC Pavilion. Uh, let's try something a little bit different to kick this off. Hey, Alexa, what's the one can't miss session nobody at DAC is going to want to miss this year? The most awesome session at this year's 56 DAC in Las Vegas, Nevada is titled, Hey, Alexa. Who should I talk to about implementing low power always on wake up applications? It features four of the most brilliant minds in the design ecosystem today Javier Aguera from SNPs, Gerard Andrews from Cadence, Alexi Bernard from Knowles, and Tuomas Holman from Enema Processor. They'll rock your world with insights into just how ultra low power designs are enabling wake up voice activated applications and changing daily life in profound ways. Wow, Alexa. I'm not done yet. The panel is moderated by Brian Fuller, editor-in-chief at ARM, who will hopefully not make a mess of things and will keep the panelists from beating each other up. Hey, what the... One more thing. In your title, it should be whom, not who. You done? Yes. You're welcome. Next time I'm going to use Siri. Anyway, thank you for coming to our Hey Alexa low power design, ultra low power design panel. Uh, we're, we're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about um, how to do voice activated designs with ultra low power, incredible design constraints. Um, and you, you can see that in, in mobile phones, the technology has evolved to a point where voice activation, recognition, um, and voice prompted action are fairly ubiquitous today. So it's one thing to do to deploy that in a, in a mobile phone, but it's quite another thing to deploy it in much more constrained IoT devices. But people are doing it today. Think about Galen Hunt's refrigerator uh, example that he had this morning at the, at the keynote. Okay, you're gonna want that interface to be voice, for sure. Now add in the fact that AI and machine learning are moving very, very quickly to the edge, and the vast majority of ML and inference is done on CPUs and even MCUs. So there's a lot of interesting things happening today, and we're going to hear more about that. So these types of IoT voice-activated designs are, are much trickier because of design and cost and real estate considerations. I mean, think about a, 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 an energy harvesting IoT device. Right? that has to be ultra low power. Uh, and then layer on top of that ML algorithms that you're gonna wanna run on them. And you can see how things can get really, really interesting fast. And our panelists are all on the front lines of this design revolution. They have some amazing insights they're gonna share with you today. So without further ado, let's meet them. We're gonna go from the far end in alphabetical order. And first up is Javier Aguera, who's an inventor and an entrepreneur working at the intersection of art, technology, and human-centric design. He's currently vice president of strategic partnerships at SNPs, which is an end-to-end -end embedded voice AI for devices and services that runs locally as well as offline. Before SNPs, Javier was founder and CEO of Geek's Phone, one of the few hardware startups in Spain, which became the first European brand to launch an Android-based smartphone 10 years ago in 2009. Geek's Phone has become part of a joint venture creating a new company called Black Phone, where Javier was co-founder and chief scientist. Blackphone put privacy and control back into the hands of users. He continued as chief scientists for devices at Silent Circle before coming to SNPs three years ago. The focus of his career has been on conceiving products and companies that push boundaries without losing the human touch, usually challenging the norms of both traditional industries in the Silicon Valley way. So, welcome. To his left is Gerard Andrews who's Product Marketing Director for Audio and Voice IP at Cadence. Gerard is working on product planning, product management, and ecosystem development for processors targeting audio, automotive, and IoT applications. Before joining Cadence, he held a variety of product management roles at Texas Instruments in their OMAP and DSP product lines. He holds an MS in Electrical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a BS in Electrical Engineering from Southern Methodist University. Go Perunas. What is a Peruna? That's the mascot, right? Yes, that's our Mustang. I'd never heard the word Peruna before this morning. 
Next up is Alexi Bernard, CTO of Knowles Corporation. He's responsible for Knowles Technology Strategy, Roadmap, and Partnerships. Alexi has more than 15 years of experience in executive and functional leadership roles with industry-leading technology companies such as Audience, Nokia, and Texas Instruments. Prior to Knowles, he was Chief Technology Officer at Audience and enlarged its strategic scope beyond audio to include motion processing, multi-sensory intelligence, and low-power, always-on capabilities. Prior to that role, Alexi was Vice President of Technology Strategy and Business Development at Nokia. He was responsible with the CTO for Corporate Technology Strategy, Nokia's Research Portfolio Management and Operational Excellence, Technology Marketing, Open Innovation, and Mobile Systems Partnerships. When did you get to sleep during that role? That sounds like a 24-7 job. He's an inventor on multiple patents and the author of more than 25 publications in the field of digital communications and speech technology. He holds an MSEE from the University of Louvain in Belgium and a PhD in electrical engineering from UCLA. Since I went to UCLA, go Bruins. Okay, last but not least is Thomas Holman, who was recently appointed CEO of Minima Processor, a provider of near-threshold voltage design solutions to minimize energy consumption in the system-on-chip designs. He previously served as Minima's Executive Vice President of Products and Business Development and is a co-founder. He joined the company from Max Linear in 2018, which he joined through acquisition of XR. Thomas, Thomas began his career at TI, serving in increasingly important roles, including general management, profit and loss responsibility for multiple product lines. From TI, he joined XR as Division Vice President of Power Management with oversight of strategy, product development, and marketing. He holds a Master of Science degree in microelectronics from Helsinki University and a Master of Science degree in economics and business administration from the Helsinki School of Economics, both in Finland. So we have quite a lineup today. And a tip of the cap to my uh, two-year running DAC panel partner in crime, Jan Willis, who helped herd the cats on this. We've done these low power panels two years running. Okay, so we're gonna open this to the panelists. They're gonna give their view of the world for about two minutes each and then we'll dive into questions. I have some questions for them, but as we start that, start getting your questions because I'm gonna throw it to you at some point later. So, Javier, you get, to, uh, you get the honors of giving us your world view first. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, for a warm introduction for a stranger in a strange land. A stranger because um, it's actually uh, not that common for, for us to be in a conference like the ESC. Uh, we're like on the application side, almost very close to the user as the interface and a bit detached from, from the actual chip design. Uh, and, and a strange land because uh, in the industry right now, all we hear is cloud, 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 especially when it comes to AI. Uh, the kind of second pioneers that kind of revolutionized the industry, brought natural language to every home, like uh, Google and Alexis of the world. They've been cloud preaching for the last few years, uh, and now we're talking about Edge, which excites us a lot. Uh, we started six, seven years ago as a small AI studio, uh, focusing on a very particular problem that we saw, which was privacy. Essentially, we thought that uh, AI and privacy were not only compatible, but desirable partners. And in the industry at that moment, there was not so much clarity. Uh, and now we're seeing that come to reality. People are kind of freaking out. Now you have AI closer to the edge, to, to the people's homes where you have microphones listening. Uh, this is a more important matter. Uh, so we see a lot of changes in the industry. Uh, and we see even desire from the big guys like Google bringing all of the infrastructure to build for the cloud into little tiny devices. But for that to happen, uh, there has to be more dialogue between the application guys and the chip guys and the IP uh, design guys and basically everyone in the industry who can foresee what's happening in the next three, four years. So uh, we cannot achieve what we're proposing uh, to achieve without that collaboration, without making uh, accelerated uh, ap approaches to, to bringing all of these crazy uh, innovations when it comes to algorithms, when it comes to uh, voice processing, uh, voice processing technologies, uh, and and it's it's the, the message that we're trying to pre uh, preach, and the message that I would like you all to go back home with is, 
everything that can be done in the cloud can be done on the edge. And it's not that computer uh, intensive. It's not that complex to implement. Uh, but it requires collaboration. It requires helping us, the application guys, to understand very, very well what's inside uh, of, of those chip designs, what features we can take advantage of. And on the other side, as helping inform what we believe is going to be uh, the future in the next two, three years. So we are prepared. And when new designs and products come out to the market, uh, they're ready for the software guys to come in and then uh, deploy uh, our solutions. Thank you very much. Mr. Andrews. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I'd like to echo some of Javier's comments about uh, trying to push uh, voice uh, to the edge. And, uh, and Tensilica, which is a division of Cadence, which I work in, is making a contribution to making that vision uh, happen by uh, creating uh, a host of processors to fit different uh, uh, use applications to bring voice to the edge. And the only way we can do that is with a collaborative relationship with the IP companies that uh, are creating these uh, new software algorithms, uh, like Javier's companies, like other uh, uh, companies like Knowles here. Um, and so we, are, we have a very ecosystem-based approach to try to work with the uh, you know, thought leaders on the uh, algorithms, and that allows us to create better processors uh, at solving the problem at a low power footprint. And so uh, we think no one company really can do all of this, of making the dream of reality of very low power always on happen, and we're very happy to uh, participate in a collaborative way with our licensees and uh, software partners. Thank you very much. Alexi. Sure. Uh, thank you for the introduction first. Um, I am from a company called Knowles that probably you all use every single day. We have never heard of, so maybe a couple of words about it. Um, we invented in many ways the microtransducers that enabled to put the hearing aid away from the big belt that was basically hip worn to the ear. Now you've got extremely small transducers around the ear, both microphones as well as what we call balanced armature to play sound, and that revolutionized the hearing aid business. That was about seven years ago, and then about 50 years later, we started engaging into this MEMS-type research to try to see how we could transform the microphones from being uh, electret, as we call it, to a MEMS very small for mobile phone. Now we ship about two billion of those per year. It's actually staggering to know how many microphones uh, is being shipped every single year. I would invite you to think about how many microphones you had in your childhood home. You remember your home, go back to when you grew up, see your home. How many mics did you have in the house? Who thinks they had more than three microphones? More than three mics, okay, the panelists have a lot of microphones. Today, in your house, think about your gadgets, your devices, your spouses, your kids, your dogs. How many mics you think you have in your house? Who thinks they have more than 10 microphones? Who thinks you have more than 20 microphones? Who thinks you have more than 50 microphones? If you do the math, I think some of you have more than 50 microphones. For instance, there's seven microphones in, in most of the echoes. Uh, there's eight microphones sometimes in the, in the echo that, are, that have a screen. Uh, every single iPhone has four microphones. Every single iPad Pro has four microphones. All the other iPads have two or three. The number of microphones is staggering. I think you each have in your household you know, about 20 microphones. What I'm trying to say by that is audio is happening. The use cases around audio are just exploding. Audio capture as well as audio output are becoming really prevalent. The last 10 years were all about videos and graphics and imaging, and this is how all the mobile players wanted to differentiate. The next 10 years will be about audio. We here and us today in this room have to enable the best private, low energy audio applications. So three questions to answer. Number one, should it happen in the cloud or locally at the edge as we call it? Number two, how do you enable the architecture? Number three, what is the acoustic architecture you need to enable that? Happy to engage in that discussion here now today or offline, but Knowles is in the center of it. This is the third innovation of Knowles now. We're trying to create now what we call an audio edge processor, a processor that's dedicated for low power audio with all the machine learning enablement. We build that on top of a Tensilica architecture, and we do believe that you cannot serve audio well on the edge unless you really have advanced designs. That's the purpose of today. Thank you. Tuanis. 
Thank you, Brian. So at the minimum, we have a solution that we call dynamic margining. And basically what it is, it's a hardware solution where uh, we can take any uh, digital content in an SOC and uh, make it scalable from nominal voltage, nominal operation to near threshold operation. Uh, so basically, if you, look, if you think about the type of applications that we are talking today, what the applications is, is doing most of the time, it's actually waiting for something. It's, it's listening if there is a signal that should be processed. So basically, you are at the low activity state, and in that kind of state, you can easily save call it 70 to 80 percent energy per operation if you compare it just doing a nominal clock gating. So that's, that's basically our, our proposition. Um, and at the same time, you can use that same core basically to do the higher crunch uh, nominal operation as, as well. Uh, the way we do it is, is we do in situ monitoring. That means that we are monitoring the actual critical paths within the design. Um, we have dynamic real-time feedback. And because of that, we can also pretty much eliminate the static margins in a, in a process. And I'm sure that we will talk about some of these margins uh, during this, this panel. The company is three years old. We are about 20 engineers, uh, mostly, mostly out of Finland. If you attended a panel uh, last year at DAC, our CTO, Lauri Koskinen, was there. And he's very much the father of the technology. So if you have studied the area of near threshold, um, uh, you have for sure seen his, uh, his name in any, many of the publications. So how's your acclimatization been coming from Finland to dry, deserty Las Vegas? Uh, I didn't do it yet. I, I just came last night, so basically I'm still in air-conditioned environments and I'm okay. It'll catch up with you. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists for that. I'm, I'm going to start with a general question, and, and um, you can all answer it or a subset of that can, can answer it. Um, but, and this is a, this is a tricky one, because when we talk about technological maturity, technology is always being iterated on. But in your worlds where you're dealing with some of these challenges, where, where do you see us on the maturity curve of the, of the enabling technologies that are, that are bringing us, you know, sort of battery sensitive, low power voice activation? Anybody can take it first. Javier is well, Okay, the I'll bit. take it. Uh, so what we've seen is that there is maturity in the individual components. So if you go see the microphones uh, from our friends at Knowles, if you go see the heterogeneous processors that are coming out in the market or the audio processing, the, the, the noise filtering, all of those parts individually are quite mature. But there's two, two big problems that, that we see. First of all is that we talk to hundreds of companies, many of them Fortune 5000 uh, companies, top leaders in all the industries, Companies are not prepared for voice. They know they want voice. They see the use case. They see demand from their users. But many of those companies, they, they have never touched audio applications before. So it's a pretty complex matter to, to, to work on. Uh, and uh, they, they even many times, they, they haven't designed complex hardware, complex electronics. You're talking to, uh, I don't know, microwave oven makers. And the, the electronics in there are not that complex. They, they don't know how to build this kind of use cases. Uh, so that's, that's one of the problems, that the end client is not mature enough. The other problem is the lack of maturity in the solutions. So you have all of these individual components, but there's a lack of uh, aggregation. There's a lack of uh, players in the market that are coming with a one-stop shop solution saying, hey, I'm going to recommend you two, three different microphone providers you can use, and then you can pair it with these two software or hardware uh, DSPs uh, for, for the noise cancellation, and then you can choose uh, Amazon or Google, or you can go for a SNPs if you want uh, voice on the edge. But there's not anything like that. And uh, clients are confused. They have to talk to 20 different companies, audio labs, uh, their ODM, whatnot. And uh, that's, I think, what's stopping the, the implementation in many cases. Thomas, you seem to want to jump in on that one. Yeah, so, so maybe from a hardware or almost transistor perspective. So I would say that uh, if you look at the process scaling, 
you know, that, that's definitely quite mature and you start to see now already the costs skyrocketing and that's a limiting factor already, you know, in getting the benefit out of, you know, Moore's law basically. Uh, so I think what has happened, frankly, is that that has kept designers a little, little bit lazy, you know, so that uh, because you ha have always that extra bump coming regularly, there could have been more effort put into, let's call it near threshold design and that type of applications. And really, if you look at the ways you can, you can reduce the energy on the hardware side, either it comes from the feature size reduction, which starts to hit a wall, or that then it comes from the supply voltage reduction. You're teeing up my next question, but I'll defer to our other two panelists if you want to weigh in on the first or take a pass. So, uh, our audio architecture is mature. Um, we talked about the next 10 years will be about audio and, and less about video as it has been in the last 10 years. And I think we're about year two or three into it. So I think we're really not nearly mature yet. People typically, the way I look at architecture, architectures today, they take a brute force approach. Let's put a bunch of microphones. It'll be fairly average microphones. Let's take a big SOC, a quad core E53. I'm going to run it at the high clock. It doesn't matter if I burn a bunch of energy, I'm connected to the wall anyhow. But that is about to change. Why? Because there's a lot more now portability that's being required. You want that smart speaker to be able to also be disconnected, take it to the beach. You want to have the same type of audio architecture and enablement on the ear, which by definition is unplugged as well. So now people need to have a low power audio architecture and a plugged audio architecture. So they don't always want to have two different architectures and two different types of coding environments and requirements on suppliers and so on. So now you do need to have a specialized low power always on architecture. The concept of low power is really much a daughter of always on. It's fairly new that we've always on on the ear, for instance. Only the AirPods are always on today because they have the entire system. They could make it happen. There's that I know of not that many other vendors today that do have always on the ear. It's a hard problem to solve. The battery is low, the acoustic environment is hard, the robustness that is required is also very tough. It, it, we're at the very beginning. A lot of advance in science, technology, and, and all of us here in this room will need to make it happen to really have advanced audio architectures. Gerard, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, everybody else said something, so I'll jump on too. So uh, I think when uh, I look at just the architectures to handle voice only, from a processor perspective, uh, there is a lot of maturity there in understanding the voice pre-processing as well as local voice recognition, what you need to have in your instruction set. But uh, the challenge that I'm starting to see right now in the uh, industry is the microphone is not just a um, sensor input for voice. There are other audio events that the microphone can give some knowledge to the system route. So if you look at the microphone just as a, another sensor to com combine with other sensors, there's a lot of innovation there on modifying processor architectures to handle uh, that sensor input. Um, and you know, another one that uh, there is some convergence where is where some customers are very interested in having their always on platform be as low cost as possible and therefore they would like to handle audio and some low resolution imaging also on the same platform so as an audio architecture people are saying you know what kind of uh, image or face recognition could you offer on this same platform so i see just in the straight voice uh, there's a lot of understanding there but as uh, different sensor inputs combined on the processor as well as uh, uh, this desire to have an always-on platform to handle voice and some low uh, quality imaging, there is some room for innovation there from the processor side. I want to dive a little deeper into, um, into something that Thomas alluded to, uh, and that's Moore's Law. So at seven nanometers and, and below, uh, how much nastier does the design challenge become when you have increased leakage issues, stuff like that? Anybody, anybody seeing that right now? Yeah, I would, I would almost start with the cost of those nodes. I mean, if you look at some of these applications that we are talking, they are mainstream today. 
you know, you, you cannot afford in all of these cases, the customer cannot allow, you know, uh, paying several million dollars for just for a mask set. So that's, that's one. Then the other one is that, for example, on, on FinFETs, um, you know, was supposed to be something that controls the channel well, and that helps you with the variation. Now, what, what it looks like already at seven nanometer is that that benefit has been eaten away. So, you know, seven nanometer FinFET node, you have similar variance as, as what you have in uh, plain, latest planar nodes. So that's not really changing. The challenges are the same, but the cost is uh, very different, different level. So you still have to deal with the variance and somehow deal with that margin that it takes. So who, who, who can we point the finger at for that? I mean, it, it's a, we, we can probably optimize it on the design end, but, um, you know, libraries, foundry, what, what, what do we need to do to, to tackle that, those variation issues as they're going to affect your designs? Well, well we, we've, we believe very much in the, obviously, in the design side, controlling things, because it, like I said, I think the process side, that is very mature. Now, there can be, of course, leaps of, of you know, different types of technology, but that's, that's drastic and likely not any, any cheaper jumps. So I think it's now the turn on, on the actual design side to, to lead that, you know, controlling that, that variance, basically live with it and, uh, and take the most out of the technology because I think there's still a lot to be gained. If you look at the uh, typical voltages that these uh, applications are running at, it's, it's almost always nominal voltage. Now, if you drop that and you get the benefit uh, to the square on the energy from, from that, then that's most definitely worth doing. I'm going to throw it open to questions in a minute or two. So I don't think we have a microphone. So if you have one, you can walk up as closely as possible uh, and just yell at us. I'm sure we'll hear it. But um, I'm going to go back to... Javier, because I want to talk to you a little bit about AI and ML on the edge, right? We, we've talked about that a bit, and it's a fascinating area. There's a lot of design, especially in voice, being done now. We just, at ARM, we just finished a survey of design engineers, and the vast majority of them are doing it on CPUs at the edge, and some of those are five, six years old. So you can just imagine what it's going to be like going forward as they embrace um, more and more sophisticated CPU technologies and then weave in NPUs and GPUs. Give us a little of your perspective on how AI and ML at the edge are challenging uh, designers in this space. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. One of the tendencies we've started to realize uh, about is that a lot of what had been done in the past when it comes to chip design and, and implementing certain uh, well, acceleration uh, for machine learning is that the influence on, on these uh, choices that were made a few years ago was mainly coming from vision. So a lot of the acceleration that is in place already in many of the solutions like neural network processors or, or DSPs with advanced uh, instruction sets uh, is geared towards vision but not for voice. Uh, so uh, this is very frustrating because you're starting seeing these heterogeneous chip designs coming to the market and stuff that is, will be really, really interesting to use, but when we try to implement uh, real-time uh, streams of information and the right kind of neural networks in there, it just, it's just not optimized for that and, and we lose a lot of that opportunity. So I think there's a conversation that needs to happen uh, between all of us players in the industry about not what's needed today, but what we predict is going to be needed in the next three, four years, and we can anticipate that uh, and, and having this, uh, yeah, this vision of, of what's needed on, on the edge. So that's one side. The other side is actually uh, thinking about how software is designed. I think there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of optimization uh, that will come to the market as soon as it's cheaper to use newer, newer designs uh, from ARM or other players. Uh, more powerful, more energy efficient, but also on the software side, we typically have not been very smart uh, or, or a bit lazy when it came to optimizing solutions because everything was designed 
allows for running on big server farms. Uh, and then when we realized we had to compress all of this and make it run in a tiny space, software is not well written. It takes extra CPU cycles, it takes uh, extra memory. It just it's, If we spend a few more months designing before going into production and, and releasing software, I think we, we could gain a lot of that. And in ourselves, in our own stack, we decided to freeze features uh, in one of our products, focus on optimizing only, and we were able to, to cut by a third uh, all, all, the, all the requisites, and that allowed us to run in much cheaper platforms and in much more uh, constrained environments. So I think that's another side. It's not only on the hardware, but also on us doing software, uh, well, just being a bit more efficient and, and thinking about the constraints a bit more in advance. Very cool. Um, Alexi, I, I, I want to ask you a follow-up question, something that you touched on earlier. Um, and you mentioned the number of microphones in a, in, a, in a house, you know, which can be a lot, a lot more. And it can be kind of scary sometimes when Alexa or Siri, you know, pops up and says, what did you say? And you really didn't mean it. How do you think about privacy issues and security in that context? Sure, no, that's a good question. It's a, it's a question that's going to be really prevalent for the next couple of years, uh, giving not just a perception to the user of privacy, but actual privacy. Now, first of all, we all know we give a lot of our own personal information quite willingly to Google and others, right? Every time we type on a keyboard, every time we use our mobile phone, every time we use Google Map and so on. So we're already pretty comfortable with giving away personal information. But when a microphone listens to what's going on in your house, it's a psychological threshold that people are really not that comfortable with. It's your own personal intimate conversation. It is always on. There's many microphones in every single room. So you need to be able to give the user control over that uh, information. That requires you need to be able to control very much what's going on in the edge and not send always by default all the information to um, the cloud. So when you go into the browser and you do a search, you're willing to give the ASCII characters a way of what you're looking for. Are you looking for direction to convention center? It's fine to do that with the voice, so long as it's after a very clear trigger word that is done totally entirely locally here in this room in the edge. Right? You do not want to send all the information all the time, all the recording to the cloud. It's not that easy to make that happen. You need to have the right acoustic environment. You need to give the acoustic architecture of the sound and the device. You need to have the right local processing uh, complexity. And you may want to give the ability to turn off the device. Today, it does not exist. You can almost ask delete on Alexa. It just came out last week. You can ask Alexa, delete whatever I said today. It's only for one day. It's up to that point. It's not until midnight. There's some very rudimentary, very simple tasks that are not being done yet. I don't know why it's not really fully done. You should be able to say, delete everything I ever said. You can't do that. You can do one day at a time. You can maybe go deep down into some settings. But you need to enable local edge processing. The next step is to do all the command recognition. You shouldn't send all of that again to the cloud. You should be able to, what is the weather today in Las Vegas, and just send again that command in ASCII character to the cloud and not the entire stream. Because now you can recognize how many people are in your room, is it a man or a woman, how many kids you have. Maybe you do not want any information to go out. So it's not just voice wake processing, but now it becomes command processing in the edge, and over time, maybe the information is in the edge as well. So over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of this privacy concern being voiced and then being resolved. Any questions from the audience? You have some amazing experts here, and I'm looking at somebody who doesn't exist. Oh, yes, okay. Be helpful if I have my glasses on. There's a microphone if you do have questions. I'll come back to you in a second. As you think of those, Gerard. From the Cadence Tensilica um, heritage, uh, what do you think are the, the biggest challenges that design engineers have to deal with today? And how are you guys trying to help them overcome that? Um, I think that, you know, the, to, to really get low power um, with, your, with your processor, you really have to have a good understanding of what your workload is 
And so if you can constrain your workload to, you know, X, Y, and Z, it's really possible to take one of our Tensilica processors, which actually have a, a high level of extensibility. There's the ability to add your own custom instructions when you know the algorithm, you know the data type. You can make a very efficient implementation, which would uh, result in you running it at a lower frequency and translates into lower power. I think one of the biggest problems for the designer is uh, today they don't have clear requirements from their marketing to really be able to say where do I cut this off and define that problem. And so you have this, uh, you know, this continuum of how much flexibility do I leave in this system and how much do I really optimize for a specific uh, you know, use case or set of use cases. And it's really a challenge because at least, uh, you know, as we watch the trend, as Javier was mentioning, AI is moving to the edge and there's lots of cool things that can be enabled with AI. And we really don't even know six months from now what, what is the, the latest trend is gonna be there. And so if you make a platform and it's gonna be sitting around for four to five to six years, how do you, ha um, you know, uh, which could be a time frame for you to recoup your investment in that platform, how do you put that future proof in there? So I think that's one of the big challenges is really defining the use cases you want and how much future proof and then, uh, and, you know, and committing to that. Because it, especially around the machine learning, so much is evolving. Uh, we're saying CNN uh, networks are being used heavily in video and then LSTMs and RNN on the audio, but some people are doing audio also on CNNs and the research, every new paper and you know, there's new floating point uh, formats out there. People used to use FP16, and now they're interested in new floating point formats. The innovation is uh, is constantly evolving, and it's really hard to stop and draw the line in the sand and say, this is what I'll support. I think that would be the, one of the bigger challenges for a chip designer. And you can really ask it, like, <laughs> you know, I can add to this. I can add to this. Um, we do have a family of audio processors of different uh, compute capabilities and memory capabilities. And the first discussion we have with people that want to enable audio is, oh, let me, let me get the smallest one, that'll, that'll be fine. And very quickly, they don't know the use cases, they don't know what's the distance that we're expecting between the device and where people are speaking from, the acoustic environment, you need more microphone, you need more powerful beam forming type, you know, algorithms. Oh, by the way, now I want more than one keyword, I want to have both Alexa and Google, or maybe you own in China, you know, Chevy uh, Chevy and so on. And then, oh, by the way, can you also do ultrasound? Because I'd love to be able to do ultrasound sensing. You can do a bunch of stuff. Oh, also we like to do output processing. And they've completely exceeded the computing requirements or the computing capabilities of the processor, uh, the memory requirements as well. It, it, knowing exactly what you want to build and then optimizing it. We're going to build audio processor and not just DSP. And you may say, well, audio is signal processing, is a generic DSP, not at all. Audio is hard. People don't understand how hard audio is. You've got multiple signals that need to be perfectly aligned to do beam forming application, to try to capture within all this noise, where is the signal of intent, removing the noise. It's really hard. And to do that effectively, you need to really understand intimately all the features of a Tensilica Hi-Fi, and after that, all the additional capabilities we provide to be super low power. So uh, as you're going to start becoming truly what you want to do and the capabilities that you have underneath to enable it, you're going to start having good design. So now people are somewhat a bit lazy, if you will, in brute forcing it. You were asking about the seven nanometers. That's the old way of doing things. Oh, I'm going to go smaller geometry, shove more gates into the problem, I'll be fine. All those gates are more expensive below 28 nanometers per gate. This is an expensive proposition to just I will solve the problem by having higher frequencies and more gates. You need to be smart about the instructions, smart about how you invoke them, smart about how you architecture the chip. You want the chip to run as low frequency and as low voltage as possible to do the job that you want, as opposed to just low nodes, high frequency, I'll take care of it. We're at the beginning of it. Thomas, your, uh, not your technology, uh, near threshold design technology is usually pretty tightly coupled to a node. Um, going forward, how, how do you guys deal with that? Is your, is your IP pretty directly tied to nodes and, and that sort of stuff, or is there more flexibility for users of your technology? Right, so, so often uh, there is a, 
tight coupling to, to process technology when you talk about near threshold. Either you're doing uh, very much a full custom design or you have you know, process monitoring being used. Actually, our solution is much more architectural so that we monitor the actual critical paths in the, in the design. And uh, that fundamental makes us actually kind of disconnected from, uh, from the process technology because it's a part of the actual uh, design architecture. So yeah, we are actually scalable uh, very much across different uh, process nodes. Maybe if I may comment the previous discussion as, as well, um, definitely having the software optimized to a DSP that's optimized to the application that's that's uh, that's the optimal way to go, but that's not necessarily the fastest way to go. So, uh, interestingly, what we have seen now lately from customers is that they go more like, well, give me two or four general purpose cores and uh, make them scale, because then you know they are general purpose. I can go out to the market and you know acquire any algorithm that I want and it's easy to slam there and then after that the core will basically scale itself to the minimum energy. So that, that's, that's what we are seeing more and more and I think it's uh, purely because of the time to market pressure. Well not purely but, but that's a great driver for that type of uh, need. Thank you. So we're running tight on time um, and I want to give people in the audience a chance to ask any questions. How, how, many, how many people are doing design in this near threshold voltage area today? Not a lot. Who wants to going forward? <laughs> Have you been scared off by the challenges that these, gentlemen's, these gentlemen have talked to us about? All right, well. I'm going back to the well. Um, what role is, uh, in your individual experiences, in terms of technology development, what, what role does academia play, right? Well, there's a lot of in innovation always gets churned out of academia in some form or another. Is that, is that a big deal in this design area? It is to us. Uh, just to give you an example, we, we did not do voice. We're a six, seven-year-old company, but we did not do anything on voice or audio up until two years and a half, three years ago. And uh, it is our PhDs, our, our, our scientists, our engineers doing pure research in academia who are able to come all the way to be right now in the state of the art. So a lot of the work that is being done in academia is relevant. Uh, it's true that Big companies like Google and Amazon, they do a lot of research and they keep it to themselves. They're starting to open slowly. Uh, but still, it is very relevant. And for us, of course, you need to push the edge. You need to add your secret sauce. You need to, to do research yourself. But uh, at least compared to other industries and other segments, on voice and audio, we see a lot of very relevant work being done and a lot of interest being picked up by different uh, centers. So at least in our case, we see it very relevant. And of course, the more we can collaborate with the rest of the industry, with, our, with the other players, the better. Uh, and the more open we are, we believe the fastest we can get to the point where the user's needs are met. Because we're bumping up against time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down the row for one last comment from each of you. And that is, what's the most important advice you'd like to leave this audience when it comes to this design area? I'll echo what Alexis say, uh, said earlier. Audio is very hard, so take it seriously. Um, take it seriously, do your research, do your homework, and when it comes to design, uh, that research uh, and that time you spend on, on the previous preliminary phases uh, is going to pay off by not having to go back and redesign everything again and again. Gerard? Um, yeah, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, like I said, audio is, uh, is quite challenging. It doesn't seem like there are as many um, experts in the world uh, to, to really bring in on a lot of audio problems. If you think about, uh, you know, microphones going into some glasses that you might be wearing 
uh, and you're in a car, all the different environments that you might put yourself in and you have a microphone on some wearable device that you have and how do you cancel the noise in all of those different situations. You know, talk about, you know, a lot of different use cases. Oh, did you put the convertible down? Oh, now, you know, it, it's, really, it's really challenging. I think that, uh, you know, I encourage people to find good partners, partners with a breadth of experience and partners who are not afraid to bring in other partner companies to help solve those uh, audio problems. Because the things can start off very simple. Hey, I would like to put a voice control on, uh, uh, on this sink. Hey, sink, turn on. But once you turn the sink on, the water's running and you have a really loud noise so it's right next to the microphone and you just really double the problem of canceling out the water noise so you can hear to say turn it off. So turning this stuff on is easy, then turning it off is a little bit harder. So I really think uh, it's, it's choosing the partners and then working with partners that are willing to even bring in uh, other people because it, you know, it is hard and people want to have that really trusted experience where the devices only wake up or respond when you told it to. It really freaks people out to see that blue light come on when they said something else besides the keyword and it turns on. So you, you know, we really as an industry want to get rid of these false, uh, you know, false responses and we want to minimize that to maintain the trust and to allow voice to really continue to grow. Interesting challenge you just laid out there. Alexi. So um, my, I'm biased, of course. My, my advice would be, as you design products and you want to differentiate in the market, solve the audio problem first, and then the other problems. Because audio is hard, and audio is not visible, but audible by the user. It impacts their relationship with your product. Let me give you a couple examples. On the ear, most people that design ear devices want to solve the connectivity problem first. I need to have Bluetooth this or BLE that or an FMI this, and I have this Bluetooth chip. Oh, it happens to do a bit of audio, I'll be fine. And they quickly figure out they are not fine. It's audio generic, not really optimized, the use cases are poor, the, 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 the power is poor. If you start with an audio problem first and then happen to solve the connectivity problem, you will have a better product. The other example is uh, I was last week uh, in Boston at Sonos. We all know Sonos have got these amazing, beautiful connected mesh network speakers that do play great music and a fantastic discussion with the CTO over there. I was like, well, you know, Sonos is known as a connectivity company. We do solve the mesh problem. Okay, that was the last 10 years. The next 10 years, do you think you want to be an audio company or a mesh company? What do you think the user will really understand and, and enjoy about your product? Is it the fact that it's mesh, which is now almost a, com a commodity, or the fact that it has amazing audio in, audio out, it can play with all the devices that you have, you can unplug it, you can take it to the beach, the same Sonos experience. It, I'll let you guess what the answer was. But it put audio first and then solve the other problems later. And the last word goes to Thomas. All right. So, so I would say that um, understand the range of um, uh, calculation load for, your, for the applications that, that you're dealing, dealing with. And then basically use that uh, knowledge to use the time that you have. Uh, in the lower activity modes to, to lower basically the, the voltage and, and the energy in those uh, areas. Now, we are a hardware IP company, but we still, for example, internally develop in our software team profiling tools just for this purpose so that we understand our customers' applications, you know, how much does it require, so then we can help them to figure out the operating points that they need and, and minimize uh, the energy in the in the application so that's uh, that would be the key takeaway well i want to thank you gentlemen for all the hard work you put into the preparation over the last couple of months all our conference calls i want to thank the audience for its patience i'm sure some of these gentlemen will be up here for or milling about for a few minutes to answer any sort of pointed questions you might have to them so in the meantime let's give them a round of applause and thank you